So is there like a, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> is it live now? <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, conference of the Aberlin series. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Bert Capel, who I'm going to introduce in a, in a short, uh, in a minute. Um, my name is Florent Perec. Um, I'm an uh, associate professor at the University of Birmingham. Um, I'm one of the respondents for uh, BERT today, uh, and so is Lotte Samara, um, who is uh, an, an assistant professor at the University of Freiburg. Uh, and we all share an interest in construction grammar, which is the main topic of this uh, talk today. Um, so yeah, I've known uh, Bert for a while, actually. Uh, he was probably one of the first scholars I met as I was a young uh, and naive PhD student. Uh, so specifically my conference debut at the Aflico in Paris in 2009, that's where I first met him. Um, he currently is working as, a, as an assistant professor in, uh, at the University of Lille uh, at the English department. Um, Bert uh, holds a PhD from the University of Leuven, which he obtained in 2005 with a thesis on verb particle constructions. Uh, and particle verbs are a very important aspect of his contribution to linguistic research, but not exclusively, it's not the only thing. Um, so he has uh, written on a number of different topics and bloom into a very versatile construction grammarian, one of the best around, if you ask me. Um, He's also interested in the link between language and cognition. Uh, he did a postdoc in particular in Cambridge with, uh, where he collaborated with uh, Friedemann Pilver-Müller, one of the leading experts in neurolinguistics. Uh, he even co-authored a paper on the neural representation of constructions with uh, Professor Pilver-Müller uh, in the Oxford Handbook of Construction Grammar. So you might, you might uh, be familiar with this piece. Um, he, he's also interested in investigating actual uh, language use from corpora and in contrastive differences between languages uh, with a self-confessed predilection for weird patterns. And that's, that's going to come up today, I believe. Um, so Bert can be credited for some uh, very innovative ideas on the architecture of construction grammar. I'm thinking in particular of uh, the concept of allostructions, which, uh, which he introduced. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that's going to come up today as well. Um, and well, I'm especially familiar with that concept because I've used it in my own research. Um, so today he's going to tell you about uh, construction grammar as I said uh, previously, uh, from the notes he sent us, he sent to Lotto and I before, uh, prior to this event, uh, it looks like what you're about to watch is some kind of magic show, uh, but he actually has very interesting things to say about networks in construction grammar in particular. So without further ado, uh, Bert, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Florent. Uh, for these nice words. Also, thank you, Lotte. Uh, thank you, people of Abralin. Um, so, Marcia and uh, Juliana, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, this talk, indeed, is about construction grammar. That's the topic of this lecture why constructions are cool and collectible, and how we can connect them. Oh, and there will indeed also be some magic involved, but that's perhaps too late now. <clears throat> I realize that I ruined the chances of this YouTube video ever becoming uh, a hit as soon as I said construction grammar. If you're not into linguistics, I probably had you snoring or clicking away on construction, and then I still had to combine this word with grammar. I mean, what was I thinking? I might as well have announced my talk was about college algebra or about corduroy pants. Oh, but you're still here, which means that you must agree with me, there's nothing unfashionable about grammar. After all, the word grammar has given rise to glamour. That's right, there would be no glamour without grammar. At least the word glamour wouldn't exist without grammar. Surprisingly, this is not something generally known even among grammarians that I know of. So what's the link exactly between glamour 
and, and grammar. Well, consider the original meaning of glamour before it got associated with glitz and celebrities on red carpets. Glamour meant enchantment, magic charm, or a spell that could be cast on you. The word glamour arrived in the English language as an alteration of grammar, a change that had occurred in Scots. Still, you may wonder what did grammar then have to do with magic? Well, for this, we need to go back to the dark Middle Ages. In the early 1300s, the word grammarie appeared in the English language, a word which probably via old French grammaire or grammari went back to Latin, ultimately to Greek. Um, but anyway, uh, grammarie referred not just to the linguistic study of Latin. Common people associated it with any sort of learning or scholarship with erudition in general. And at a time when not many people could read or write, this was of course suspicious. What were those mysterious scribbles in books for? Well, surely these had to be used for all manner of occult knowledge, astrology, sorcery, witchcraft, necromancy. In some, grammar meant dark magic. By the way, another word that is related to French grammaire is grimoire which we know from fiction as a big manual used by a sorcerer or witch to look up the right formula for a spell. Now, why did the R in grammar turn into an L? That's still a bit of a puzzle among linguists. One suggestion that has been made is that the gl of glamour was then more in line with its meaning. See, gl is meaningful. There's a whole family of words that start in gl and have to do with shining, as in gleam, glimmer, glisten, gloss and glow, and glaze and glass, and with the light that allows us to glare or glance or glimpse, and with feelings of someone who's glowing and beaming, such as glee and glad. That doesn't go well with the idea of dark magic, though. But then again, there are also words in gl to do with darkness, gloomy and glum, for example. And for sure, there are still some grammarians out there who are turning our discipline into something obscure and obfuscating, something muddy, confusing and impenetrable. Sometimes this makes me wonder, where's the glamour? Where's the enchantment in it all? Where's the Disney-esque magic gone? Where are those glittery sparkles coming out of our magician's wand? Well, let's try to find that magic again and put the glamour back into grammar. Now, I'm not the, most, the world's most glamorous guy. And as for magic, I'm not much of a wizard. I'm more like the sorcerer's apprentice. So fortunately, I'm joined today by two incredibly smart and pure blood linguists, Florent Perec from the University of Birmingham, and Lotte Sommerer from the University of Freiburg, two colleagues who have thought long and hard about some of the things that have been on my mind, namely how everything in language is connected. So don't tune out until you get to the discussion part so you can hear about Lotte's and Florent's comments. And if you're watching live, you can put your comments and questions in the chat and I will try and deal with them in the discussion part. Now, during my solo part, I'm going to try and perform a few magic tricks. Abralin today stands for Abracadabra Linguistics. First, I'm going to summon a ghost from the past. We'll get an unexpected guest giving a traditional view of grammar, a view of grammar as distinct from the lexicon. Next, I'll do a disappearing act. The boundary between words and rules will vanish. Another standard act I'll perform is the linking ring trick. You know what I mean? Things that appear to be solid, closed and self-contained objects will be joined together. I won't be using actual rings. This is just figurative language again. Instead, you'll be treated to such classics as pulling a rabbit from a hat and sawing a woman in half. Again, I won't actually be doing that. These are resultative constructions, which I'll use as an example. Any magician is also eager to improve on another magician's trick. That's what I'll try to do with Chomsky's famous example of ambiguity. Flying planes can be dangerous. 
which every student in linguistics knows can be understood in two different ways. Well, I'll do a magical multiplication of meanings and suggest that there are many more than two different readings for that sentence. And I'll finish by selling a spectacular magic slimming potion. All right. Let's concentrate and be silent because I'm about to call forth a spirit long dead, a spirit from the East. I will bring him to life by quoting the words he wrote. All the words in a language taken together constitute what is known as its vocabulary. However, by itself, the vocabulary does not constitute the language. It is rather the building material of the language. Just as in construction work, the building materials do not constitute the building, although the latter cannot be constructed without them, so too the vocabulary of a language does not constitute the language itself, although no language is conceivable without it. But the vocabulary of a language assumes tremendous importance when it comes under the control of grammar, which defines the rules governing the modification of words, morphology, and the combination of words into sentences, syntax. Now, who wrote this? None other than former Russian dictator Joseph Stalin. How's that for invoking a ghost? A group of younger comrades had asked Stalin to give his views on the role of Marxism in linguistics. While Stalin acknowledged he was no linguistic expert, he complied with their request in the journal Pravda the official organ of the Central Committee. I must admit Stalin had some interesting things to say about grammar. For instance, this. Grammar is the outcome of a process of abstraction performed by the human mind over a long period of time. It is an indication of the tremendous achievement of thought. Now, this is a quote that I wouldn't mind having framed or printed on a tile, only it's a bit awkward to mention the author. But to return to his other quote, Stalin stated that language consists of two parts, vocabulary and grammar. This is or was the standard view and it is still shared by many of today's linguists. Take Steven Pinker in his popular book, The Language Instinct, this is what he writes. The way language works then is that each person's brain contains a lexicon of words and the concepts they stand for, a mental dictionary, and a set of rules that combine the words to convey relationships among concepts, a mental grammar. Another book by Pinker has a, as its title, Words and Rules, the Ingredients of Language. So here again, he sees language itself as consisting of two parts, a lexicon, the words, and a grammar, the rules. This modular view with separate components is often called the Chomskyan view, we could also call it the Pinkerian view, but those who don't like this architecture have also every right to call it the Stalinist view of language. Of course, Stalin wasn't the first to draw a distinction between the lexicon and the grammar of a language, nor will Pinker be the last to draw that distinction. The origins of this distinction have been traced back to at least the 17th century. Words were seen as everything that has to be listed as the irregular stuff of language, the ill-behaved and lawless things you can't capture in rules. And grammar was seen as elegant, systematic, logical. In the first half of the 20th century, Bloomfield put it very memorably, the lexicon is really an appendix of the grammar, a list of basic irregularities. The lexicon is messy and is separate from grammar, which provides the general rules. It's still a mainstream dominant view, especially outside linguistics and, and also outside Marxist ideology. Language learning resources focus on either vocabulary or grammar. Even if they include both, there is still the implication that we're dealing with different aspects of language use. Also in schools, language teachers still give tests about vocabulary and tests about grammar, two different components. So the spirit of the past is still roaming around. It's hard to get the genie back in the bottle, but we can try. So, okay, now for my second act. 
Remember that language is often represented in a dichotomous way consisting of a lexicon and a grammar. Now I'm gonna do one of the all time favorites in the world of magic, the disappearing act. But relax, I won't let myself disappear or pinker. Look at what's happening. It's a kind of magic. It really is. I'm distracting you so you're not paying attention to the disappearing dividing line. Oh, but where is it? How did I do that? Ah, I waved my magic wand. Actually, no, I used the animation function in PowerPoint. Uh, but now, a conjuring trick shouldn't be explained, but this particular vanishing act usually comes with a standard explanation. And this is how it goes. Knowing a language involves knowing not just its individual words and the rules of combination. There are also proverbs, fixed expressions, and all sorts of popular phrases. Things like hang in there, no pain, no gain, speak of the devil, and so forth. There are hundreds upon hundreds, thousands upon thousands of such stereotyped sequences, longer than one word. They're clearly part of the language. You have to learn them if you want to count yourself among the competent speakers of a language. But are they part of the lexicon or are they part of the grammar? There's no, e no easy answer to that. You could say they're part of the lexicon seen as the repository of specific things you have to learn by heart, words and their meanings, but also idioms and their meanings. You have to know that someone can say break a leg to wish you good luck, which is not something you could have guessed the first time you heard it. Not that all idioms have to have such a weird, unpredictable meaning. Many idioms are not that special meaning wise, but they're called idioms because they are conventional ways of expressing what they mean. As a speaker, you still have to learn them because you couldn't just guess that these particular sequences are standard ways of putting things into words. So idioms are clearly part of the lexicon. Are they also part of the grammar? Well, perhaps they are too. Most idioms are grammatically well-formed. So if they are not structures of English grammar per se, they do incarnate the grammar of English. If you learned all the idioms of English that appeared in a phrase book, you would also learn a lot about the grammar of English, about how to inflect words and about how to build phrases and sentences. So we can see the boundary between the lexicon and grammar starting to fade. But we can make the dividing line disappear completely by pointing to the existence of idioms with gaps, a term used by Charles Fillmore, who is considered a founding father of construction grammar. There are several founding fathers and mothers. Others are Paul Kay, George Lakoff, Adele Goldberg, and Lauren Kays. Now, idioms with gaps, Fillmore says, are ones that are not complete runs. They don't stand by themselves, but need to be used in combination with something else to form a complete phrase or sentence. You can plug the gap with anything as, it, as long as it's of the correct grammatical type. Consider, for example, X on steroids, where X has to be a noun or noun phrase. It's often a proper noun or noun phrase. Whatever fills the X must be a familiar concept. For instance, wordle on steroids or the Italian mafia on steroids. In English, anything can be on steroids. COVID on steroids, capitalism on steroids, croissants on steroids, you name it. In other idioms, the X could also be a subordinate clause in the past tense, as in it's time X. For instance, it's high time governments acted on gambling adverts, or it's about time you made your point now. Maybe that's exactly what you're thinking, but don't worry, I'm getting somewhere with this. Just bear with me. I'd like to point out first that a single idiom may also have more than one gap. Indeed, there can be two gaps, as in once an X, always an X. For instance, once a player, always a player, or once a generative linguist, always a generative linguist. This idiom is a little special in that the two gaps have to be filled by the same element. More often, when there are two gaps, each of them is for a different element. So one gap may be for a noun phrase and the other gap for a possessive determiner, as in give someone a run for their money. In this case, the determiner refers back to what's in the first gap. 
in the idiom, I've indicated this referential identity by adding the same little index letter I. For example, in the sentence, though he lost, he gave last year's champion a run for his money, his refers to last year's champion. In other idioms, the second gap may be a possessive determiner that has to refer back to the subject, as in wrap someone around your little finger. So in the sentence, she has well and truly wrapped John around her finger, her is co-referential with she. In the construction grammar literature, a famous example of a two-gap idiom is the let alone construction. The X and the Y can be two noun phrases, that man cannot look after himself, let alone a child, or two verb phrases, someone that heartless shouldn't have kids or pets, let alone run a country. Other things are possible too, such as two prepositional phrases. I don't want to be in the same room with him, let alone in the same bed. But there are limits on what you can uh, fill the gaps with. A whole clause is not acceptable. I wouldn't even date him, let alone that I would ever marry him. Now that you can't say this is a fact you have to learn about the English idiom X, let alone Y. The direct equivalent of let alone in Dutch doesn't have this particular restriction against the clause. So it's not something you could just guess or predict. Another well-known construction in construction grammar is the what's X doing Y construction, as in what's Stalin doing being cited in a talk on linguistics. Here again, part of the game of the grammarian is to find out which sorts of syntactic units speakers can use to plug the first and the second gap. That is what makes constructions attractive. So far, I haven't bothered with mentioning the meaning of all these idioms. They all do have a meaning though. In that respect, they are very much like words and fixed expressions linguistic units of form and meaning. So for example, we have to recognize this form meaning unit as an element of the English language. The form is X on steroids with some specifications for X. And the meaning is an extreme version or example of X or something much bigger or stronger, etc. than X. In any case, the examples of idioms with gaps show us one thing clearly. There are lots of language units that have a hybrid status. They partly consist of constants and partly consist of variables. In this dictionary entry, the constants are in boldface and the variables in normal font. Because of the variables built into idioms like these, they're not fixed lexical items, they're adaptable but they still have a bit of lexical material too. So they're less abstract, less schematic and purely syntactic templates. They're somewhere in between words and rules. What we see then is that there is a continuum of flexibility from vocabulary items like words and fixed expressions to completely open productive grammatical constructions like the rules for building a noun phrase or a clause. Idioms with gaps are located in the middle, blurring the boundary and making it effectively disappear. So that is the construction grammarian's explanation of the disappearance trick. They can make the sharp dividing line between words and rules vanish simply by showing that lots and lots of language items are half lexical, half syntactic. If the construction grammarian has one credo, it is that we can't make a neat separation between lexicon and grammar or between lexicon and syntax. It's all grammar. So on the next slides, I'll present some of the many quotes from the literature. The lexicon is in important ways not distinct from the repertory of constructions. In construction grammar, no strict division is assumed between the lexicon and syntax. Two more quotes. Construction grammar makes no principal distinction between words and rules. A lexical entry is more word-like to the extent that it is fully specified and more rule-like to the extent that it contains variables that have to be filled by other items in the sentence. And instead of assuming a clear-cut division of lexicon and syntax, construction grammarians assume that all constructions can be placed on a lexicon syntax continuum a constructicon. 
Indeed, for a construction grammarian, there are not two components of language, but just one. It's often called the constructicon of a language, a blend of construction and lexicon. The idea is that there's a single large repository of language units, a big space populated by constructions, which can be defined as familiar form meaning units. Construction grammarians thus profess their belief in a lexicon grammar continuum, but as I see it, there are two continua that they believe in. One continuum is a cline of increasing size or complexity. Familiar language units can range from the very small to the very large, from morphemes, like the plural ending s or an or iti, to monomorphemic words like cat, to polymorphemic words like lover, or indeed polymorphemic, to phrases like take a break, take a break, or the lord of the manor, to sentences like the sky is the limit. And you don't have to stop there, you could go further to the right and include well-known songs or nursery rhymes, whole stretches of text that you know by heart. Now there's also a continuum of increasing schematicity or decreasing lexical fixity, as we saw before. This continuum is not just different from the complexity-based one, but is orthogonal to it. If the constructicon is visualized as a two-dimensional plane, then complexity could be the x-axis and schematicity the y-axis. This second continuum ranges from lexically fully specified constructions at the bottom to maximally schematic and abstract constructions at the top. So at the bottom, we have specific morphemes, words, fixed idioms, etc., the kinds of units we just gave some examples of. These are stored in the language user's memory and therefore they're part of the constructicon. For example, the verb phrase take a break is at the lower end of the schematicity continuum, and it is a, con a concrete instance of a slightly more general construction the verb take followed by a noun phrase. Note that all transitive verbs are idioms with a gap for a direct object. If we replace this specific verb by just the symbol V for verb, then we arrive at an even more abstract schema that for a transitive verb whose complement is a noun phrase. Almost at the top, we find VP for, for verb phrase. This is yet a higher abstraction. It doesn't care whether there's anything apart from a verb head inside of it. Finally, right at the top, we find XP, where X is just any part of speech, a very abstract unit that language users may have access to, and that represents any phrasal type, whether it's a noun phrase, a verb phrase, or a prepositional phrase, and so on. Remember that the two continua are orthogonal. In the example just given, I started from a concrete idiom of medium size and complexity at the middle of the X axis and then went up. But I could also have started more towards the left from the noun lover. The lexically listed noun lover at the bottom is more specific than the schema verber, which is more specific than a base with nominalizing derivational affix which is more specific than the category noun, regardless of inner structure, which is more specific than any word level syntactic category. So construction morphology is really like the rest of construction grammar. It also goes from concrete to abstract via intermediate levels of schematization. More towards the right, it would be possible to schematize over say several concrete cooking recipes and propose a general construction for them, a recipe for recipes, if you like. Now, to write a recipe, you have to respect a certain conventional template. You need a title, usually of the form X, for example, Belgian waffles, or X with Y, for example, Belgian waffles with barbecue sauce. This is followed by, optionally followed by a short background paragraph where you say when or where you first tried X, with Y. Here you also promote the recipe by saying that X with Y is quick to make or that it is perfect for this time of the year or that it is very healthy or not so healthy but simply irresistible. And if it's a recipe for X with Y, here's also where you say why Y gives X that special touch. 
Then come the specifications, where you state the number of servings, the time to prepare, the time to cook, and the total time in case something has to be kept in the fridge overnight, for instance, and so on. Not optional, of course, are the ingredients, which could be separated into those for X and those for Y. Ingredients are in list form and may have telegram style. For example, one TB paprika for one tablespoon of paprika. Some recipes are helpful enough to provide a list of the kinds of kitchen equipment and utensils you'll need. And next comes the preparation, usually as a list of steps. These use special ellipsis constructions used for instructions. For instance, cook until tender. And at the end, there may be some serving suggestions and nutritional facts if these weren't already given in the specifications, links to other recipes or to a video, comments, etc. So to sum up so far, idioms play a, play a crucial role in our story. As language users, we have to learn lots of idioms so we can't ignore them as irrelevant or peripheral. Single words can be seen as very short idioms and lyrics, prayers or poems, you know, by heart as very long ones. Many idioms have open slots as well as filled in material. The less filled in material an idiom has and the more open slots, the more it is like a construction, the way everyone understands the term construction. Instead of saying that every stored linguistic unit is an idiom, we might just as well say that every stored unit is a construction, including even fully fixed idioms and single words. That is the construction grammar ID. Construction grammar is a bit like jazz. There's no single way of doing it. One style of construction grammar does seem to make a terminological distinction between signs, which are fully specified pairings of form and meaning, and constructions, which are more abstract, more open. Also, the jury is still out on whether the very general constructions should be treated as four meaning units. Maybe they're pure form. On the other hand, even very abstract categories or templates could be described in terms of what their prototypical realizations mean. Now, what is that construction grammarians do? What is it that we do as language scientists? I wish I could say that we linguists are masters in cracking a secret code, like a Amy Adams, who in the film Arrival plays the part of a linguist figuring out what aliens are communicating to her. The truth is, though, that most of us grammarians are doing something much less glamorous. Construction grammarians, in particular, are sometimes accused of just being curious about finding a nice little construction to do some work on for a paper and then move on to another construction. To some extent, that's true. Now that everything is an idiom from small to big and from fixed to open, all we seem to be doing is collecting butterflies, as it's sometimes disparagingly called. But hey, constructions can be really beautiful or curious and fill us with a sense of wonder. At the recent workshop, someone was presenting such a special construction and afterwards the organizer said, oh, we all love your construction. We're all a bit jealous of it. Now that is a very typical reaction. The kind of constructions we typically go for is preferably, preferably somewhere in the middle of the schematization continuum. Patterns with one or more open slots, idioms with gaps as Fillmore called them, or as Ray Jackendorf refers to them, constructional idioms. We construction grammarians, are especially fond of somewhat quirky constructions, such as the, the X or the Y construction, the body part of or out construction, or the noun preposition noun construction. The latter construction is one that Lotte Zometer has recently written paper after paper about. It's not that Lotte isn't interested in the higher level as well. I mean, she's written a whole monograph about the emergence of a fully abstract determiner plus noun construction in the history of English. So she and other construction grammarians do also work in that higher level. It's just that the perception among non-constructionists is that we love idiosyncratic constructions so much that most of our energy goes towards finding unusual patterns. 
and describing their unique syntactic or semantic properties at the expense, presumably, of seeking broader generalizations. Construction grammarians are aware of this perception. Laurent Perec, for instance, warns explicitly against the temptation of just collecting butterflies. And the habit can get worse. Guillaume de Sagulier uses the expression chasing butterflies to refer to the practice of browsing through corpus data in search of a savory example. This is an even more extreme kind of instructional butterfly collecting, focusing not even on low or mid-level generalizations, but trapping actual tokens, catching individual specimens. I myself have also wallowed in this activity of going after the unusual, not just remarkable constructions, but also striking examples of them, also known as constructs. I'm not the only one. Construction grammarians know about the pet constructions of other construction grammarians. So on Twitter, they may add someone to draw their attention to a rare find. Here's a tweet by Laura Michaelis. For Adele Goldberg, the adjectival resultative construction is not extremely productive. So finding these tokens can be very gratifying. This one is almost as good as was Bobby Womack's You Heard My Eyes Open. So we see there an example of don't dress yourself old. So are we just chasing butterflies? Are we just interested in the weird and wonderful? No. The belief that practitioners of construction grammar are not concerned with the broader picture is far from correct. First of all, decline of schematicity with highly abstract elements at the top and fully, uh, fully specified items at the bottom is an inheritance hierarchy. Properties of the higher units can pass on their properties to the items lower down the hierarchy. This inheritance can be partial as there can be lower level patterns with their own properties, just like children don't always inherit all their parents' char characteristics. I mean, just imagine. Second, and more generally, many construction grammarians aim for a satisfactory encompassing theory of how linguistic units form larger networks, including more than just vertical taxonomical relationships. Of the increasing number of works that could be mentioned in this regard, some recent ones are Holger Diesel's 2019 book, The Grammar Network, Lotte Zommerer and Elena Smirnova's 2020 edited volume, Nodes and Networks in Diachronic Construction Grammar, Nicholas Gisborne's 2020 10 lectures on event structure in a network theory of language, Hans-Jörg Schmidt's 2020 book, The Dynamics of the Linguistic System, and in a book on modal verbs that I'm working on, there will also be a chapter by Martin Hilpert and Susanna Flach on modals in the network model of construction grammar. And there will also be a chapter by Lotte Zommerer and Freek van der Velde on constructional networks in the Cambridge Handbook of Construction Grammar. The idea of grammar as a network is really hot these days, but it has been around for a while. Ronald Langacker has proposed it, though he didn't use the empirical tools that we have today. Here's a diagram of a Langakerian network from his 1999 book, Grammar and Conceptualization. This network isn't meant to represent anything specific, so its details are important. And this is what Langacker writes about the elements in such a network. These structures, the nodes or vertices of the network, might consist, for example, of the allophones of a phoneme, the alternate senses of a lexical item, a family of related metaphors, or variant forms of an elaborate grammatical construction. Now, as for variant forms of an elaborate grammatical construction, my modest claim to fame is that I have given them a name, allostructions, by analogy with allophones and allomorphs, and Florent Perec, among others, has given the concept psycholinguistic credibility. In what follows, however, I would like to focus on this idea of a family, but then not of related metaphors, but of related constructions. And after that, I look at alternate senses of a lexical item. I hope it will be clear that I'm not presenting an exhaustive overview of the kinds of links in a constructional network. I'm just giving a general picture of some of the ways construction grammarians link up 
one node to another. So time for my third act. The adjectival resultative construction, which Laura Michaelis mentioned in that tweet, is part of a family of constructions. And in an article that appeared in Language in 2004, Goldberg and Jackendot drew a detailed family portrait of the English resultative. Here's one family member, the causative property resultative, exemplified by the woman dressed herself older than she was, or the magician sold his assistant in half. The form stipulates that apart from the verb, there must be three elements, the noun phrase and an adjective, well, two noun phrases, of course, and an adjective phrase or prepositional phrase. The first noun phrase is typically realized as a subject, the second as direct object, and the third constituent is known as the resultative phrase. The approximate meaning of the construction is X causes Y to become Z, where X corresponds to the first noun phrase, Y to the second, and Z to the adjective phrase or prepositional phrase. The verb plugged into the construction expresses the means of bringing about the change in property. You don't necessarily have to agree that the verb always expresses the means by which the result is brought about. For instance, consider uh, make America great again, the, so the slogan of the Trump campaign, this is arguably an instance of the causative property resultative, but the meaning is not, let's cause America to become great again by means of making it. Okay, I'll now do the linking rings act. Suppose that you have an example of this causative property resultative construction. The magician sold his assistant in half, and that you hear another utterance. He pulled a rabbit out of a hat. It would be possible for you as a language user to see that these are related. They have elements in the same position. They're both transitive and crucially, they share the same semantics of X causes Y. The result is caused by the subject doing the action. They're both causative resultatives. Let's now add two more utterances the magic mirror smashed to smithereens and a white dove flew out of the hat. Yes, I chose examples from the world of magic performances. These two are instances of the resultative construction. The one with the magic mirror as subject is felt to be similar to the magician sold his assistant in half because they both primarily involve a change of property, not a change of location. They are both examples of property resultatives. The one with a white dove can be related to the example with the rabbit because they both involve motion in space. They are both path resultative. The newly linked utterances are also similar to each other. They are both intransitive and semantically they don't have the X cause Y part. The result is not caused by an external agent. They are both examples of non-causative results. Each example here is an instantiation of a different sub-construction of the English resultative construction, which are similarly linked in a family resemblance configuration. So if, like me, you find this partial coming together of circles satisfying, here's the family picture of the English resultative construction. Voila. So what we see then is that the four sub-constructions shown here, there are more of them, do not have fully identical properties. A particular subconstruction can share one property with one sister and another property with another sister. This is what is meant by a family resemblance network. A looks like B in some respect, B looks like C in another respect, C looks like D in yet another way, and D again looks like A, but still in another way. In this configuration, there's no mother node from which all four subconstructions inherit properties. The idea of a family resemblance category goes back, of course, to Wittgenstein. There's another way of representing a constructional family, namely, unsurprisingly, in a sort of family tree where the different features are nodes in a network. Indeed, a particular instance of the resultative has several features. For example, don't dress yourself old uses an adjective phrase, 
the, the resultative phrase expresses a property and the construction is transitive as there's a direct object. And of course, it's an instantiation of the resultative construction. The mirror smashed to smithereens uses a prepositional phrase which expresses a property and the construction is transitive. Now, a couple of things are worth noting. First, this figure represents only one type of hierarchy. It's not a full entry model where higher up features are redundantly stored also in lower nodes. I could have opted for such a model, but mainly for reasons of space and representative parsimony, I opted for this simpler tree. Now, this means though, that the lower nodes are not to be treated as instantiations of the higher nodes. Property and path, for instance, are semantic values of the resultative phrase and they're not kinds of transitive. Likewise, adjective phrase and prepositional phrase are syntactic realizations of the resultative phrase, and they're not subtypes of property. Secondly, in this kind of taxonomic rep representation, the tiniest differences are represented at the bottom, whether the resultative phrase is an adjective phrase or a prepositional phrase, and the most relevant distinction is represented at the top, in this case, whether the construction is transitive or intransitive. However, we don't know what the best ranking is of all these properties. Perhaps transitivity is less important than whether the construction is a property or path resultative. So the hierarchy could be different. Maybe this alternative ranking represents more faithfully how speakers organize the family of resultative constructions in their minds. In that case, don't dress yourself old and the mirror smashed to smithereens belong to the same branch of the resultative construction. There are mathematically speaking six different ways of structuring the family in a taxonomical hierarchy here. Ultimately, it's an entirely empirical question of which of these six representations is cognitively most plausible. I'm not making any concrete proposal here of the best hierarchy. This is something that could be determined psycholinguistically, for example, using a sorting task experiment, experiment which Florent Pirec used for a number of constructions. The transitive path resultative, also known as the coarse motion construction, was actually one of them. In any case, representing different members of a constructional family in this way allows us to make concrete, testable predictions about degrees of cognitive closeness. We shouldn't draw taxonomies gratuitously. I would now like to perform my most daring act, magical multiplication of meanings, and I will outperform none other than Noam Chomsky. Let's look at his celebrated example of structural ambiguity from Chomsky 1965. Flying planes can be dangerous. A similar example sometimes used in textbooks is visiting relatives can be boring. But let's stick to the flying planes example. example. Chomsky's sentence is said to be ambiguous between two meanings. The flying of planes can be dangerous and planes in flight can be dangerous. Indeed, flying planes can be a gerund type noun phrase with flying taking a direct object, or it can be a noun phrase headed by planes. Yes, but that's not the end of it. Each of these interpretations, again, allows for a number of different interpretations, because can can mean different things. The general meaning of can, of X can Y, as in Maggie can swim or New York can be hot in summer, is it is possible for X to Y. But can has several more distinct senses to do with ability, opportunity, permission, typicality, among others. These meanings are represented here in a network. This is again a taxonomy, in this case, a taxonomy of meanings. I've used arrows going from the general meaning to the more specific meanings, but there's no real significance in that. And there's also no significance in uh, the location of these sub meanings. These more specific senses are distinct. And this is clear from the fact that you can't cross these readings when you use an anaphoric structure. Consider this one. Maggie can swim and so can Lisa. Now this can only be taken to mean that both Maggie and Lisa are able to swim. 
or that they are both allowed to swim, and so on. It cannot be uttered to mean, for instance, that Maggie is able to swim and that Lisa is allowed to swim, but has never learned to swim. That would be highly misleading. The sentence could only be used this way when you want it to be funny or smart, although I doubt that people would find it hilarious or very clever. That is why in this representation, the general mother meaning expressing possibility is encased with a dashed line. This node in the network is presumably less strongly entrenched than the more concrete daughter nodes, which are more easily activated. What we have here is a case of semantic ambiguity, not vagueness. Since these senses are distinct, our two interpretations for Chomsky's sentence can be further fleshed out. If flying planes is a gerund, we can obtain two more specific readings. The most readily available reading, I think, is one of typicality. The meaning is then something like flying planes tends to be dangerous or is sometimes dangerous. I will have more to say about this typicality interpretation. Flying planes can be dangerous, could also be imagined to be uttered by the head of school for pilots who intends to say something like this. Here in our program, it's not safety first, it's experience first. We shouldn't worry too much about our students' safety. We want our future pilots to embrace danger as part of their training. So it's entirely permissible for the flying of planes to be dangerous. Flying planes can be dangerous, then means flying planes is allowed to be dangerous. If flying planes is understood as a noun phrase headed by planes, then again, we have two more specific interpretations. It could mean something like, it's typical for planes that fly to be dangerous. And again, I'll say more about this in a minute, but our sentence could also be uttered by a ruthless air show organizer who finds it permissible for planes in flight it presents some danger to the spectators. Like, it's okay for me if they're dangerous. They can be dangerous. Our sentence could also be imagined in a context where terrorists are looking for an efficient weapon that, that can cause a lot of damage. One of the terrorists could then suggest flying planes as ticking all the boxes. They can do many things. They can transport us to where we need to be. They can be sneaky. They can reach high speeds and they can be dangerous. So flying planes have the capability of being dangerous. In this context, the ability sense can be activated, but only with some difficulty, hence the dashed lines. With a stative verb phrase, we don't normally get an ability read. So we already have five different interpretations for Chomsky's sentence, but let's look at the typicality interpretation. This is also known as the existential use of can. For this specific meaning, we might consider uh, at least two further sub senses. Now, to see this, suppose you said kids can be annoying. I could then say, not mine. You could then ask, what do you mean, not mine? And I could then say, well, you said kids can be annoying. Mine are always annoying. Now, if this sounds mildly funny, it's perhaps partly because you understood kids can be annoying as some kids are inherently annoying little brats. Just like roses can be orange, means some roses are orange. Orange is the stable color of certain roses. So you thought that I meant that my kids weren't annoying brats, unlike some other kids. It then becomes clear that I had accessed a different reading, namely kids are sometimes annoying, and that I took issue with that. In other words, the typicality or existential use of can has at least two different subsenses, one with some, there are some x's that y, and another with sometimes, there are times, sometimes, at which x, y's, and possibly a combination of these two some x's, sometimes y. Some x's, sometimes y inherits from two other nodes. It's what could be called a case of semantic amalgamation, where a node in a semantic network is the result of multiple inheritance. By the way, multiple inherent inheritance is a pervasive phenomenon. 
any given novel sentence in language like the one I'm uttering right now is the product of several dozens of constructions coming together. Yeah? So a, con a construct inherits semantic and formal properties from all these constructions, each of which is responsible for only one tiny portion of the utterance. Going back to our flying plane sentence, the typicality reading could break down into these. Some flying planes are dangerous, flying planes are sometimes dangerous, and some flying planes are sometimes dangerous. Likewise, when flying planes is a gerund, we could have these three readings. As for some planes, it's dangerous to fly them. As for planes, it's sometimes dangerous to fly them. And as for some planes, it's sometimes dangerous to fly them. And together with the two permission readings and the ability reading, we end up with nine different readings. That's by virtue of the possibility to make use of both the syntactic ambiguity of verbing nouns and the lexical ambiguity of can. In different usage contexts, the speaker will access a different combination of the options made available by these two kinds of ambiguity. And now for the final part of my presentation. Martin Hilbert has recently drawn our attention to what he calls the fat node problem. This is what he writes. It is fair to say that up to now, the focus has really been on the nodes in the network rather than the connections. And I consider that to be a problem. Current models of the constructional network store, store nearly all the information in the nodes, while only very little information resides in the connections. Now, the constructions I have myself described in the past are indeed sometimes very fat constructions. Some of them are truly massive. For example, I recently tried to capture the properties of the not X construction, as in not that guy again, or not on my watch, or uh, not if I can help it. Um, yet it took me um, you know, quite a few lines to state what its properties are, even though uh, that construction looks deceptively simple. And even with all that information stored in that construction, I'm not even uh, fully convinced that I have adequately captured um, the details of that construction. Now, the details are not important here. What matters here is that you can appreciate that a constructional node of the type presented here can be quite fat indeed. That is because constructions, which are often informally described as form meaning pairings, can contain different kinds of information, both in the form and in the meaning part. Many students of cognitive linguistics and construction grammar will know the figure on this slide from a handbook by Croft and Cruz. As you can see, both the form and the meaning part can be filled with rich detail pertaining to various sorts of properties. So the meaning half of construction does not just specify semantic properties, but it can also specify pragmatic information. Pragmatics is often overlooked or seen as unworthy of constructions because when it's pre-installed in a construction, it's not clear for some how it can be pragmatics. For example, this is a quote from an unnamed colleague who commented on a manuscript in which I dealt with the conventional, conventional pragmatics of a pattern. This is what they wrote. To my mind, conventional pragmatics is almost a contradiction in terms. Pragmatic meaning is what is not conventionalized, but only implied. Well, I beg to differ. Very often constructions are associated with rich pragmatic meaning, including their typical illocutionary force. That is the intentions and feelings that you typically want to convey with a construction. Apart from semantic and pragmatic specifications, there may be specifications about information structure, for instance, about which part of a construction is most relevant to the context utterance, or which part contains new information. So there can also be information about how the construction fits into larger patterns that transcend the boundaries of a single sentence. There may furthermore be all sorts of specifications dealing with the register or with how emotional the speaker tends to be. A construction can also include sociolinguistic information, for example, specifying which groups of society are likely to use the construction, mainly youngsters, for instance, or mainly women, or a construction may be specific to a regional variety, 
which again needs to be specified. Admittedly, all this information makes constructions very bulky. But there are ways of squeezing much of that fat out of the node and into the network. For instance, when I showed the network of meanings of CAN, I had in fact already presented the semantics of the CAN construction as external to the constructional node. By means of a symbolic link, it can be detached from the formal part of the construction, which is its own node. And this formal node can also be decluttered and unpacked into its separate parts by means of sequential links in accordance with what Holger Diesel proposes in his book on the grammar network. These links, by the way, are called syntagmatic relations in Schmidt's recent book. Now, it may seem unsatisfactory to link this form sequence to just the mother node of the polysemy network, which may not be cognitively very accessible because of its highly abstract meaning. We cannot claim on the one hand that this mother node may have little or no cognitive reality, and on the other hand, suggest that it's the mother node that links up with the form of the CAN construction. A solution is to link this form to all the daughters and granddaughters uh, in the semantic network. In this graph, then, we can see three kinds of relations in this small network. Symbolic relations between the form of the construction and each of its meanings. Sequential relations between one component of the form to the next. And polysemy relations, which here form a taxonomic network from general to more specific ones. Note that there are also other semantic relations, such as metaphorical ones, from a little meaning to a figurative one. Pragmatics can also be represented as external to the construction. This doesn't mean that pragmatics has no place in constructional analysis. Conventionalized pragmatics, as I stressed before, may be part of what we know about a construction. It's just that here again, we can use links. For example, consider have a look at something and take a look at something. These patterns could be considered two alice structures of a single support verb construction with the noun phrase a look, which is not shown here on the slide as a mother uh, construction. I'm simplifying a few other things here. I'm leaving out the optional prepositional phrase with that, for instance. Anyway, these alternatives each have their own pragmatic preferences. While both variants can be used with the same range of pragmatic functions, um, it's, it's take a look, sorry, it's have a look that is significantly associated with requests, uh, as in the instantiation shown here, can I just have a quick look? And as for take a look, we are much more likely to find this alternative in orders such as take a long, hard look at yourself. As you can imagine, as you can imagine, we also find different sets of collocating adjectives in the open positions of these two alternatives. In other words, there are also filler slot relations to be recognized between specific adjectives and the optional adjective position in the two alternatives. So little, we, and quick are often found with have a look, while long and careful and critical collocate strongly with take a look. Pragmatic functions are rightfully treated as external to these specific patterns. Such functions are very general and they have an existence independent of the patterns that realize them. They may also be language independent. As such, they are comparative concepts, a term first used by Martin Hustelmann and adopted by Bill Croft. Now, lots of things can be squeezed out of constructional nodes semantic content, pragmatic functions, also formal aspects. Many of these things can serve as comparable concepts. The advantage of this radical slimming is that we then have the opportunity to compare constructions, not just within languages, as we show here for have a look and take a look, but also between languages. Now, Ben Linkfeld and colleagues have a project aimed at comparing entire constructicons of different languages. To do so, one needs to have a non-language specific linking space populated by all sorts of comparable concepts. These may come in several kinds, 
in this linking system, there are general functional notions like topic, agentive, past, causative, but also certain more formal concepts like pronoun, relative clause, coordination, etc. All of which can be defined in language neutral terms. Also in this linking space are frames, that is certain recognizable scenarios that can typically be expressed in a single clause. And SDR there stands for strategy. The figure highlights how in the English constructicon, uh, the English progressive, as in he's dreaming, uh, and uh, the, the Portuguese gerund construction, estar, v plus endo, have more in common than uh, the Swedish counterpart, which expresses an ongoing activity with a coordination structure, as in sitta, ok, drömma, which literally means sit and dream. Note that such a linking system could also be used to compare regional varieties of a single language, such as Brazilian Portuguese, European Portuguese, Mozambican Portuguese, etc. Ultimately, then, the constructions in a constructicon can become ultra lean nodes. They're then just practical labels for the linguist. They are not solid nodes that we can't crack open. They're more like hubs in complex assemblies of nodes, not all of which are constructions themselves. Does that mean that we have to abandon this famous quote by Goldberg? What makes a theory that allows for constructions a construction-based theory is the idea that the network of constructions captures our knowledge of language in toto. In other words, it's constructions all the way down. It seems like the network is no longer purely a network of constructions. Or is it? It's true, the network is no longer a network where all the nodes are constructions, but the constructions are still there somehow. Our grammar knowledge can be represented as a network of acoustic forms, lexical concepts, pragmatic functions, semantic frames, registers, values, and much more. And when these concepts in the network are frequently found together, they are bound together. And the strongly connected concepts we thus get are what we perceive as constructions. Okay, I've come to the end of my presentation. Before formulating a couple of further thoughts, let's take stock of the main points. Well, first, always remember that grammar is the etymological source of glamour. Let's not forget about the magic of our enterprise. From now on, when you want to refer to the modular view of language with a separate lexicon and a separate grammar, don't refer to Chomsky, don't refer to Pinker or any other linguist, just refer to Stalin. Construction grammarians join lexicon and grammar in a single space, the constructicon. And there's a continuum of complexity and a continuum of schematism. Constructions may be linked in a family resemblance network of similarities, at least in quite a few cases. A single lexical item can be multiply ambiguous, and so can be a more grammatical construction like X can Y. And that's why the famous sentence flying planes can be dangerous does not have just two, but up to nine distinct interpretations. What's inside the construction can also be squeezed out of it. What we then have in the network are no longer pure constructions, but nodes of various types, forms, meanings, speech acts, register values and so on. And constructions can be cute and adorable, but we don't just collect them, we also connect them. Okay, um, there are just a couple of issues which have been left untouched, or that remain somewhat out of the spotlight, but which are important perhaps for further discussion. First, I don't think I adequately stressed the emergent nature of the network which is that learners generalize over usage events that are similar in certain formal or functional respects. And that's, of course, how more general schemas can arise from more specific ones. Second, um, some non-constructionists think that for construction grammarians, everything is a construction. 
words, grammatical schemas, even fully compositional sequences. And they say, well, your theory hardly explains anything. If something is weird, you say, oh, it's a construction and that's it. Well, that's just not true. First, not everything is a construction. There are also constructs, products of more or less simultaneous activation of several constructions coming together in a novel way in a new phrase or sentence or a new word. These are not stored unless they have high enough frequency to be added as a node to the network. And second, as for explanations, since we represent constructions as nodes in a network, we are trying to explain the properties of entities as arising through their relations with other entities in the network. For instance, consider the Dutch sentence, ik wens je snel beterschap, which means I wish you a speedy recovery. Now, what is the status of snel? You might think it's an adjective, because it's positioned before the noun, and in a way, snel beterschap is probably felt to be a noun phrase by language users. But if so, snel should be inflected, snelle beterschap in Dutch, which isn't the case. So it must be an adverb, but it's not the wishing that happens fast. Well, we could argue that snel beterschap also inherits from another, perhaps poorly entrenched note, which itself is an instance of a well-established pattern, the verb wensen with a complement clause in which snell can occur as an adverb. So this is perhaps a case of syntactic contamination, constructional contamination. In any case, seeing links between constructions is what allows us to make sense of what otherwise is a purely idiosyncratic node. Well, there are many more issues to be discussed here, but I'll stop here. Well, for those suffering from COVID or anything else, I do wens you snell beterschap. And I thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Bert. Um, so uh, I'm not sure how this works because I'm not seeing any questions on the chat. Does this mean there's another feed that I don't have access to? Um, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, they are. Right, okay. So um, there are some questions from the audience and uh, uh, you know, if, if anything comes up from uh, uh, myself or Lotta, we might, we might jump in and participate in the discussion. Right, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, Bart uh, Bloom, asks, with the squeezing out of constructions, don't we return to a separation between grammar, the links between nodes, and lexicon, the nodes, but with a somewhat different configuration? Well, I'm not sure that we return to um, a lexicon grammar discontinuum, but what we do end up with is uh, a large space representing presumably um, our linguistic cognition, our linguistic competence, where not all the nodes in the network are constructions per se, but are portions or properties of constructions. And it is true that some of these uh, portions may be lexical items that otherwise would be part of longer sequences of constructions. So in that respect, yes, there's like a teasing apart again of constructions into, yeah, partial aspects of those constructions. Would that help maybe to give an example in which this network representation of uh, grammar versus lexicon separation is not really a separation, but this kind of representation is, is better than a strict splitting of lexis versus syntax? Well, it would still be better than a strict splitting of lexicon versus syntax, because, um, um, I mean, take the example of X can Y. Um, I'm not sure whether in, in, in syntax, uh, well, in, in, the, in the modular view with, with syntax being separate from, from lexicon, that would even be allowed anywhere either in syntax or in lexicon because x can y okay there is a specific 
modal auxiliary being used here, so it's lexical, um, but it's not syntactic enough. Yeah. Um, so even if you separate the X from the can from the Y, as might be done with these sequential links, it's still better than saying, okay, we have this strict modular view with a separate syntax and a separate. Uh, so you mean, if I, if I can uh, rephrase, so you mean in a modular view, uh, we would have the auxiliary can uh, from the lexicon with its range of meaning, it would be inserted in a rule with all of its meaning, but that wouldn't capture the fact that uh, there are preferences between certain meanings and certain other aspects of the sentence, basically. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And an even better example, uh, also um, taken from what I presented, is um, have a look and take a look. If we just had um, a lexicon and a syntax, where in the lexicon we just had individual words, then there's no way we could say that have plus a look um, was used for preferentially for, for certain pragmatic values compared to take a look. All right, thank you. Um, so next question, uh, Eli Matos, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, and, and, and similarly for the previous name, um, who says it resembles neurons that fire together, wire together by mm -hmm. Donald Hebb. Do you think the construction network can be implemented by a computational connectionist approach? Um, that, that's ambitious. I'm not sure whether this could be done. Maybe it should be done. Um, it's certainly one of the desiderata of uh, construction grammar to, to bring the, the network model more in line with what is known about the workings of the brain. And indeed this Hebbian view where what uh, fires together, wires together, uh, is something that strictly speaking should, yeah, should be implemented. I'm not sure how practical it is um, and how much you know, typical traditional uh, grammatical description work we linguists could still do. I mean, you, you could try and, and model everything in, in, in terms of uh, the workings of, of the neuron. Um, and that's certainly a worthwhile undertaking. At the same time, I feel that, okay, we don't have to necessarily go as far as that, or not all of us have to go as far as that. Let some of us still try to do a bit of old fashioned uh, descriptive grammar work. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that um, I don't agree. It's, it's, um, it's a good idea to, to try and do that. And some people have tried to do that. I've been trying to do that. I mean, I, yeah. I would jump in right here. I, mm -hmm. I agree in the sense that you can always, uh, I think con uh, computational connectionist approaches can shed a lot of light on language acquisition and the description of learning and also statistical learning and stuff like this. At the same time, as a diachronic linguist, you know, where we also try to describe the change of a language system from point A in time to point B, very often lots of connectionist findings are not as useful lingo to us to describe the philological changes that we observe in the longer time period. And this is why sometimes it also may still be feasible to, to keep the, the FET nodes, you know, um, uh, and what they stand for, because the, the phenomenon at hand that we try to explain is not close enough to, let's say, the cognitive or neurological side of things. Although I subscribe to a, uh, an approach to language that should claim or try to be cognitively plausible and adhere to the cognitive commitment. Mm -hmm. True, true. Also um, in, in current network models of the type that construction grammarians provide in, in, their, in their 
visual representations. Uh, there are typically links between one node to another, just a single link. Whereas in actual fact, if we wanted to model or mimic the way neurons behave, there may also be uh, bi-directional links and inhibitory links and, and all of that, uh, which um, is not one of the tools that we currently use in, in construction grammar typically. I mean, most models that we use, right, they neither way uh, the, the links as many connectionist models do or semantic vector space uh, models but additionally to that I mean we have chosen the community has chosen a two-dimensional visualization which of course the two-dimensional visualization which is practical for printing uh, and writing it doesn't do justice to the intricacies of the fact that everything is connected and I also really congratulate you because this was one of your strongest contributions when you showed this lovely graph, you know, uh, of, of the flying planes and how it all hangs together. Um, it shows us that the symbolic relations, the sequential relations, the polysemous relations, all this in reality um, ultimately leads to a, a very intricate, complex, three-dimensional relationships. But we, we don't highlight this too much because yeah, perhaps it's just impossible to get this on paper. Yeah, and perhaps mm -hmm. it's also not necessary. Yeah, but this is this is what we should not forget. You know, all these different types of relations. When we call, when we say that some of them are horizontal and some some of them are vertical, we mean a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it is true indeed that if we represent uh, the constructional space. As a, as a bi-dimensional plane with the axis, the x-axis being a decline of size and complexity, uh, then we can't really talk about horizontal relations the way we typically do, because these horizontal relations are not from a small unit typically to a bigger one. Uh, they're from units, from one unit to another one of equal size, more or less. So there should actually be also a z axis, which, which is the depth of, um, of a, a three-dimensional space. That might still be feasible uh, to draw. Um, and I think Friedrich van der Velde has, has done a good job of, of um, representing this depth in one of his graphs. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, I think part of the tension here in this discussion is that uh, in mainstream construction grammar, these uh, networks tend to be used as an illustration of whatever is discussed. Um, so if it's too cluttered, you know, if you want to uh, actually represent all the link, links that there could be, but it becomes too cluttered, I think the researcher will tend to simplify the network. Uh, so it's mostly used as an as a as a research tool in the sense of a tool for illustration purposes and to represent the the distribution of a construction or the structure of a particular area of grammar. Um, and we don't need to represent all the links when we have such a purpose, but for a purpose of modeling the um, network correctly. Um, yes. <laughs> mm. uh, a more cluttered, a more dense network uh, is probably, yeah, um, should, yeah, that's probably what we should do, actually. Mm. And, and that connects to the question about, uh, like, a computer, some kind of computational modeling of, of the situation. Um, as, as Lotto was saying, it's, it's probably more tractable to do things in a computational uh, simulation rather than on paper in two dimensions. Yeah. yeah. Mm. At the same time, um, modeling something even in a very simplistic way may also be a way of generate, uh, generating testable hypotheses. Um, so when you come up with uh, an uh, arboreal representation, a, a tree with the features represented from bottom to top. I mean, you have to make certain choices and these choices are not random. They're not without consequences. 
So whatever you represent there in the tree is actually a hypothesis that lends itself to being tested. Right. Uh, sure I had something to that. say about the, so still on that question, don't want to spend too much time on, on the single question, but still on that question, but I'm not exactly an expert in neural networks and connectionist modeling, but I think that it's something else that they do. Um, it's, it's more of a computa purely computational modeling rather than modeling of some particular phenomenon that happens to be a network. So basically, um, what I mean is that uh, neural networks tend to be black boxes, tend to be, you know, there's something going on that we don't understand and it's not really re readable. Um, so I'm not sure if neural networks, as they are used currently in, uh, in, in artificial intelligence, for example, would be an accurate representation of the things, of the kind of network um, approaches that you've been talking about. Um, so yeah, but again, I'm not exactly an expert in, in that, in that domain, but may, maybe that calls for a different kind of, uh, computational implementation than, than pure neural networks as they are used. Mm, yes, I, I, I would agree here because these neural networks, um, used in machine learning, uh, have different purposes. Um, and also, I mean, which living creature has the entire Wikipedia in their minds? I mean, it's it, even if you come up with a particular uh, network, that couldn't possibly uh, a cognitively plausible uh, representation of what is in the mind of a, of a single individual. Um, I would like to take the chance to come back to something that you said very early onwards, namely on butterfly collecting and this critical fact that we tend to postulate one construction after the other. Now, um, I would like to back you up on this by saying, yes, of course, if we want to be taken seriously as a model of grammar, of change, of creativity, of compositionality, Perhaps construction grammarians should also move on to focus more on, on phenomena like multiple inheritance or unification fusion, as it is called. I think that is definitely under-researched and we have, to, we have to tackle it. Although, for example, Thomas Hoffman is, is currently doing great work on this and also Michaelis and the whole Fillmore crowd has known about it for years, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I mean, butterfly collecting, we, we look at the semi-specific reason for, or the semi-specific level um, for two reasons, right? And there is a good one and there's a bad one. The, the bad one is, and we have to admit it, is just simpler to find it in a corpus query. You know, the moment something is specified in a query, it's much easier to extract the data from, from a corpus. And that's a bad reason to do it. But the good reason to do it and the good reason to, 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 to still be in love, you know, and enchanted by this specific level, the lexicalized level is, that very often, I mean, we, we find that there is lexical attraction inside of constructions, collocational, uh, uh, you know, attraction. And, and when words co occur and when there are strong lexical biases that we also detect and investigate when we look at those semi specific levels in the sense of which words are attracted into a particular slot, this also tells us a lot about the overarching semantic nature. Of, of, of the, the higher templates, you know, what all these things may have in common. And also looking at this level empirically can support the postulation of various mid-levels uh, if they should be postulated for a particular construction or not. If we find lots of idiomaticity and quirkiness, the lower levels are more important. There are other families that are behaving so regular, regular semantically that we can easily move on to the higher levels. So I think um, there, is also, there is also reason uh, you know, meta-theoretical reasons for why we look at this level. Um, of course, I'm not only talking about fully frozen chunks, you know, um, but, 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 and I think you showed it very well. 
you know, that this is, um, this level is important. It is, it is. Um, and also because um, there may be different degrees of productivity uh, playing at, at this mid-level. Um, and of course, the, the more productive a particular node is, the, 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 the higher up it can be postulated to be in, in the network. Um, but I mean, not just these collocational preferences, maybe it's, it's two sides of the same coin though, but uh, different degrees of, of productivity and also different sets of uh, collocational preferences um, tell you something about how general the construction is, is, is felt to be, presumably in, in, in speaker's cognition. Um, right, if I may, I, I'd like to come back to um, your discussion of the different uh, possibilities of the inheritance hierarchy, you know, you, that you illustrated with the, result mm -hmm. with the family of resultative constructions, so the different ways of combining, of, of, uh, of uh, representing these constructions, these network in a simple inheritance hierarchy. Um, so I've got two things. So first, um, I think this choice, you know, between the two, well, the fact that we have these different options presupposes that there's only inheritance relations and it's only single inheritance. So do you agree that this problem might simply be solved if we allow for multiple inheritance? Or some form of horizontal links between constructions to capture the things that uh, the inheritance relations and the super constructions do not capture. Wow, uh, complicated complicated question here. So you're, you're talking about the resultative construction mm -hmm. family, right? Um, and so the question I take it is whether these uh, sub constructions entertain among themselves also horizontal links, right? Rather than just being uh, daughters unconnected daughters mm -hmm. at that yeah. of a single mother construction. As one um, of the options basically, or multiple inheritance. So basically, yeah. so to, just to talk very, to give a very concrete example, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, intransitive property resultative would inherit from the intransitive resultative uh, and from the property resultative nodes of the network. Right. Yeah. So that will be multiple inheritance, mm. or you would decide that one of these things is kind of primary. You would have a hierarchy based on form, for example. So you would have uh, property resultative, sorry, intransitive property resultative uh, inheriting from intransitive resultative. Mm -hmm. But you would add a horizontal relation between the intransitive property resultative and, and the other property resultative construction, so the transitive property resultative, I'm sorry, that's very wordy. Uh, uh, you would add this, this horizontal relation to capture the, the kind of the paradigm of, of property resultatives, uh, if you will. Uh, well, I don't really know uh, whether it makes sense in this case to have links, horizontal links, as we could call them here, uh, between these different uh, daughters. So in this case, for example, between the intransitive property resultative and the transitive property resultative. Uh, I know that Goldberg uh, proposed that these two were linked mm -hmm. by means of a, a subpart link. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, I find that a bit unsatisfying. I can't see how, for example, um, a construction realized by the lake froze solid is a part of, um, you know, uh, he beat him unconscious. Yeah, um, I mean, of the construction instantiated by the latter one, of course. Um, so seeing a, a horizontal link here in this case feels a bit, you know, uh, a way of, okay, drawing as many lines as possible almost between nodes in the network. Um, I don't see whether that is the case, um, but I, I do agree that there is this other way of representing 
um, this, this constructional family. And that is indeed by saying, okay, you have transitivity and intransitivity as a node in the network and a particular sub construction, a particular daughter or granddaughter even can inherit, uh, for example, uh, the property of being intransitive and it can also uh, simultaneously inherit the property of being a property resultative uh, and it can also inherit the property of having an adjective phrase as a resultative. So there can be multiple inheritance. That much seems to be true and, and is something that I can live with. Um, it may actually surprise you that uh, I, who, uh, who, who like horizontal links, am not perhaps in favor of, of positing more horizontal links here between the daughters of the resultative construction. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, just wanted to add to this. Um, yeah, I also agree that, I, I, I mean, I'm also a bit un, um, not, not quite at ease with the subpart relation. Um, so it seems to work semantically. Semantically, one is the subpart of, of the other, but formally the relation is, is, is more complex, of course. Um, mm -hmm. and, and by the way, something that uh, we tend to forget, or I, I have tended to forget, is that uh, Goldberg actually defines subpart and other kind of relation as a type of inheritance. So to, uh, to her, that would be an inheritance relation as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I had another, so there's another question on the chat and I had another question on that same topic we're talking about. Uh, but before that, would you like to add anything to this, Lotta? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so my, my other question, it's not really much of a question. Um, it's more of an assertion and like, do you agree with me? Um, I, I feel like, so in this question of how do we split up the, the network, how do we draw the inheritance hierarchy and which level do we choose first to separate the construction and you know, how do we proceed? I have the, the feeling that there's an unspoken rule in construction grammar uh, that inheritance networks are based on form first rather than meaning. Mm -hmm. So you would first divide your network between transitive and intransitive in that case, and then on, only do uh, only divide them in terms of meaning. Uh, do you have the same feeling? Am I, am I making this up <laughs> or is it? No, and no, is there no, any there... that you know of for, for this? So, so what was your last question? Well, do you have the same feeling? And is there, and, yeah, you, yeah, and if so, do you think there's any basis for doing this? Because um, I'm not sure there I... is. First of all, I have I have the same feeling, and uh, there there probably is this uh, formal bias. Um, I also kind of immediately felt drawn to first saying, okay, you have transitive and intransitive ones. Form is easy; that's immediately visible. And then you start worrying about, okay, but mm. what sorts of meanings are expressed by those forms? Um, that could be. Uh, and that is presumably also an answer to that question here on the chat. That could be uh, a way in which um, the analyst mm -hmm. affects, you know, the outcome of, of the modeling uh, rather than the data that are being modeled. Um, is there any basis for that? I don't know. I don't mm. know. Um, perhaps not. So this is, again, an empirical issue that could be determined, as you know, uh, via psycholinguistic uh, experimenting. Yeah, I mean, at and the same time, done, I... no, sorry, go on, go on. No, no I, it, it's, high, it's high time it was, it was done uh, for a larger range of constructions. Um, that's all I wanted to add. Mm. I mean, Florent, I'm, I'm also with you on this impression that form comes first. At the same time, it mm -hmm. also depends on, on the phenomenon that you're looking at. I mean, if when people look at discourse markers or greeting devices and they assume that all these greeting devices can be linked as sisters, they don't, you, you can say, hello, hi, bro, how mm -hmm. you doing? And independent of form, you would connect them on a sister level, probably based on their function of all of them being greeting devices. At the same time, when when links are being, many scholars who, who uh, draw horizontal lines um, or conceptualize nodes as sisters 
uh, when things are in um, paradigmatic opposition, like my house, your house, her house, their house, they share a similar formal shape, those templates, yeah? But at the same time, there is always also semantic and functional similarity in these. So I think it really depends, but what, what I think is so important, and that is what Bert clearly stressed again in his presentation, which I think why it is, so I'm still enchanted, by the way, I think it was not only a magical show, but it was full of truth that my students are always confused because this is exactly the point that they don't get because we're not honest about it enough, that it depends on where you start. It depends on what you focus on, how your final network will look like or your final network sketch which is only an estimation of the truth. You know, it's not, it's not saying that this is the only way you can go about in, in connecting those constructions of yours. And I think we have to be more honest about the fact that in that sense, the, the individual um, plays a role and, uh, or the, 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 the point of view of also the, the, of the scholar psyche perhaps plays a role. Um, yeah, this is also connected to this aspect. You didn't say something about, but I'm also curious about it. You you didn't you you mentioned how pragmatics can be incorporated in the individual templates, and I couldn't agree more. I think IPA constructions clearly show that pragmatics uh, that has conventionalized in the population, you know, um, can be part of of a, a four meaning pairing. Um, where where is your position on sociolinguistic? Uh, or socio-discursive uh, aspects here. You mentioned that certain constructions can be, you know, that, that a speaker can have knowledge about the fact that a certain way of coding uh, belongs to a certain socio-social uh, group or something, but could you say a bit more about this? Well, yes. Um, many constructions are very neutral with regards to how you can use them in which circumstances. Uh, but for many, many constructions, uh, certainly lexical items, uh, we know full well that they are perhaps not appropriate in certain contexts. And um, well, this is information that we have about these constructions, so it can be stored as part of the, of, of the properties, sociolinguistic properties or, or register-based prop, properties of these constructions. Uh, perhaps another way of looking at this um, is that maybe in the mind we have different overlapping uh, constructive cons, ones which are suitable in certain circumstances and ones that are uh, filled with words and other items, constructions, patterns not suitable in, in certain circumstances. And that, um, yeah, we don't have to um, specify that a particular construction is, is, uh, has a particular value, but we could just say, okay, it belongs in this. I mean, think of this uh, representation that I showed towards the end with the different language specific constructicons. Uh, maybe we could just say that it belongs in this particular cylinder where one cylinder is, is casual speech and other constructions could belong in a very formal language cylinder. Again, this is a matter of visual representation. I don't know uh, how this works cognitively, uh, but it is true, no doubt, that this is information that must be there somehow in our, con in our cognition. Mm -hmm. my, my take on this um, would be that there are some kind of, um, contextual variables connected to constructions that are part of the function, uh, sorry, function uh, pole of constructions um, and that depend and that are constructed according to what the situations you witness certain forms. So in a very exemplar based view, I think uh, work by Bybee uh, is very, uh, it illustrates that, that idea, this idea very well um, that Every time you encounter an exemplar, you actually store a wealth of, of very rich information about the context in which this exemplar mm. was produced. 
and that's what becomes part of the of the of the meaning if you will of, of constructions in a very extended uh mm. um yeah idea of meaning um absolutely yeah and so that also means that that um certain environments can trigger all sorts of uh, lexical items and and uh, expressions and intonation patterns even tones of voice and so forth um and it comes very naturally and that is because you know everything is so interconnected uh, experiences and language and language is part of experience um so there's a question on the chat um I, I think we touched on on the on the issues that the question uh, is asking about, but just to make sure we actually answer it. So, from uh, a question from Aberdeen Scientific Committee on Sociolinguistics, can the profile view purpose of an analyst affect a more or less virtual modeling of the intricate relationships that affect grammar or its level of, of its levels of representation? And to this, I would add, it's not in a question, but I would add, if so. Isn't that problematic from a from a scientific perspective? Um, and there's a, a second question: uh, what the what does the sociolinguistic or socio discursive experience has to do with it? Yeah, I think we just answered this. Um, yeah, we we largely answered that. Uh, so there is, of course, this uh, observer's bias. Uh, also, linking up with what Lotte said, if it also depends on the sorts of phenomena that you're interested in. If you're interested in, in discourse markers, uh, you're thinking about discourse markers independently of their formal realizations. Uh, you want to know, okay, what does a greeting uh, look like? What, what forms can it take? Um, or what are, you know, uh, connecting devices between paragraphs and then you're not necessarily interested that much in, in uh, okay, I'm only interested in, in particular adverbs. You, you want to see the whole range of um, kinds of expressions that, that can encode a particular meaning or function. Um, so yes, the, um, the, pro the profile of view or purpose of an analyst can certainly affect yeah, ultimately, what sorts of phenomena we're going to take into account, and I guess then also the sorts of networks that will be drawn um, on the basis of the elements that we feed into that network. I'm not sure uh, I fully get the second part of the question, though, um, whether experience here has to do with um, our experience as a language user or as a linguist. Um, but I, I think to give perhaps a too easy an answer, both will affect um, the outcome of, of, of our modeling. Yeah, just to be slightly provocative here, um, mm -hmm. isn't that problematic that we can, that we basically are saying that we can cherry pick uh, whichever analysis uh, is more convenient for us? Yeah, I mean, fellow, I was trained in, in the generative paradigm as well. And if you believe in minimalism and also the, the, the very formalist rigor, what they draw and allow to happen in the language, it's highly problematic. Yeah, because you are then saying no to to a formalism that everyone has to, to a certain extent, adhere to. And then very often, if you if you avoid this, it, it becomes circular, and then basically anything goes. But I think um, to answer this, I, I don't think that that we should just say no. It's all whatever you want to do. Just go about it. Especially for example, if I think about uh, this other criticism that we just postulate one construction after the other and then it's really hard to decide on constructional status. I think Martin Hilpert has contributed here with his five or even six or seven strategies um, that, that can show you that check a string and based on uh, those tests more or less the the more that are met the more likely it is that something is a construction you know and it's 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 of course probabilistic at the same time not everything is a construction because we all know that for example in the data i can show you that the preposition in a 
collocates with the definite article the a lot in the, I mean, occurs thousands of times, this bigram, this string, none of us would postulate that this is a construction. Gestalt, uh, uh, gestalt uh, theory tells us that something is clearly missing here. So I think we're trying to establish testable and neutral and unbiased strategies to determine whether uh, a construction deserves constructional status or not, or whether it is the um, it is the um, result of other aspects, you know. So I think it, it we should get credit for this, and we should also take credit for this and say that not anything goes, you know, definitely mm -hmm. not. Okay, at least that's where I stand on this. And then, of course, I've heard people say that these strategies. They are problematic because they always uh, uh, force you to, to define a default and a non-canonical structure first. So decide whether something is a construction, you first decide its canonical meaning, and then you decide whether this thing is quirky and deviates from the canonical stuff. So yes, perhaps we also need to find system external criteria, uh, psycholinguistic criteria, neurological criteria to decide whether something mm -hmm. deserves constructionhood. But construction grammarians are aware of this, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and we are trying as, as other models to, mm -hmm. to come up with something that can be used in a and not haphazardly sit there and just decide, oh yeah, I think that's a nice thing. And I just say mm -hmm. so, I just say it's a construction now. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, how do you yeah. see this? Well, like, well, one heuristic that could be used also to decide uh, what the, the, the canonical meaning is or the neutral default meaning of, of, a, of, of a particular pattern is to look at close equivalence uh, in another language and see what that means. And so if you see that in language A, it, it has a very different meaning, then, um, then it's close equivalent in, in language B, then that would also be a good reason to say, okay, there's something special going on here with my, with my candidate construction. And it is indeed a construction. Of course, you have to make sure that it's not the other language that has a, a weird deviant meaning for, for, for your candidate construction. So the more languages you look at, the better, of course. Um, so yes, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you that we are relatively careful in um, uh, positing a construction as a construction. That said, there is still a bit of work to be done nonetheless uh, in cases, I mean, I've seen cases, I can't cite a concrete example here, where something was posited as a construction and where I said, well, hang on a minute, you also have this construction and that construction, and this is just something that inherits from, from two independently existing constructions. So we have to have an open mind and say, well, let's first see whether this thing can be explained and not yeah, jump to any conclusions that it looks a bit weird, so therefore it must be construction. It seems like I'm saying two very different things here in my answer. But... No, not at all. I fully agree. I fully agree. Very often you can take a dual route. You can say the construct you have in front of you, you it's complex and it's interesting and it's quirky, and you fix this by postulating a template that's, uh, or you, you take the time and ask yourself, how could this be the result of fusion blending um, of, of two things. And this, of course, then would reduce the, the, the number of postulated constructions that you, um, that uh -huh. you uh, believe to exist. At the same time, it, it all depends whether you allow for lots of memory space, redundant storage, you know, if, you, if, 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 if that is a, a problem for you, uh, parsimony, you know, um, so, so, um, but there are ways, I think. Mm. At the same time, I want to, do we still have time or? Well, in theory, I think we have five minutes because uh, yeah. it's two hour slot. So I think we're supposed to end at four. Uh, okay. There's another question in the chat um, if you want to um, 
turn to this um, from Charlotte Mekelberger. Again, apologies for the mis mispronunciation. Mm -hmm. what, what have cross-linguistic analyses taught you about how the constructor can work? Uh, do contrastive analyses improve our understanding of language-specific constructicons, or do they also have broader implications? So what have cross-linguistic analysis taught you about how the constructicon works? Um, and do contrastive analyses improve our understanding of language-specific constructions? Although they also have broader impact. Well, uh, as, as, I, as I just said, yes, um, looking at other languages can be highly revealing uh, for the sorts of things that, that happen in, in you know, the, the language under study. Um, for example, uh, when I looked at the resultative construction in English, um, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, there is this particular pattern with, um, and I think I, I presented this uh, construction as one of the pet constructions with a body part off or out, like uh, laugh your, your, sorry for the taboo term, your ass off. Uh, or work your butt off, uh, laugh your head off, etc. Um, this has a, a noun phrase and a particle. Um, in Dutch, for example, you have a similar construction meaning-wise, which comes with um, with two objects. Uh, literally, we would say to work yourself um, um, a, a hunch, yeah, and built werken. So you have a ditransitive construction here in Dutch, which is used for uh, a kind of excessive activity meaning. And it's kind of strange that this same construction, which also exists in English, the ditransitive, is not recruited for, for the same kind of, of semantics. Um, so that is something that could be used to say, okay, this um, excessive meaning uh, semantics that we have in English is not something that can be pragmatically computed in the sense of, okay, you can just use your common sense reasoning uh, that it's of course not literally your behind that gets detached of your body. So this must be some sort of uh, conventionalized figurative meaning. Um, now the fact that that Dutch has a has an alternative construction for the same meaning <clears throat> is also then a reason for saying that in the Dutch language, okay, we have to posit this construction as one that 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 indeed needs to be posited, and that is not just the outcome of kind of creative online use of the Dutch transitive. Because if that were the case, then we would also have it in English, and we don't. I mean, for uh, in other respects, English and Dutch are very similar. And since the two constructions, the coarse motion construction and the ditransitive construction exist in the two languages here, and one construction is used with a particular function only in language B, say Dutch, that is something that we can use as an argument for saying, okay, we need to model this into the network. I'm not sure whether I answered your question here, Charlotte. Um, but yes, I agree basically that um, looking at other languages um, is something that, that's, that is worthwhile uh, doing. Yeah. We're probably nearing the end of our uh, slot here. So I don't know if the discussions still have anything to say here. Um, well, I do, but <laughs> there probably isn't, isn't, isn't enough time. You know, just maybe one, one thought, one thing that we should uh, maybe look into if we were, if we are to take this idea of a network, the way you presented it, um, seriously. If we had, if we are to take this idea seriously, maybe we should look at. Uh, so instead of, like, like in the way we approach sentences and and linguistic materials. Uh, generally, maybe we should look at dependency grammar approaches. Um, so a, a different version of them, because of course they focus only in relation within the sentence, uh, but maybe that could be a basis for 
a more distributed approach to construction than the one yeah. we traditionally tend to approach. Um, I'm vaguely aware that some work, in particular in word grammar, uh, trying to describe constructions using word grammar. And in this approach, for example, constructions are defined as strings of dependency relations, basically, that are conventionalized. So instead of having a kind of tree structure, it's a string of dependencies. But maybe this kind of formalism allows for more flexibility if we are to take this idea of a network, um, you know, linking uh, very specific aspects of construction, if we are to take this idea seriously. So just a thought. Um, um, yeah, maybe that, that it's there. There's certainly uh, lots of value in dependency grammar and it's closer to the network ID. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, though, I kind of hold um, yeah, I kind of attach still a lot of importance to good old fashioned phrase structure grammar. Uh, so I don't, I, I wouldn't want to get rid of, of uh, constituent structure in, in, in at least my analyses of constructions. I don't know whether I should attach so dearly to those, but uh, I think that there is cognitive reality to, to phrase structure. And that is something to my mind missing in, in dependency grammar. Uh, although dependency grammar analysis can generally be translated into a phrase structure, grammar formalism, and, and vice versa too, I think. But yeah, maybe I'm a bit old fashioned here in this respect. I mean, I agree with you at the same time, I think we have to, this is probably also something that we have to focus on more in the future. Um, in, in usage-based cognitive construction grammar, I think we do not uh, ve very often talk about, you know, whether such a model, the one that we like and, and use and try to develop, where it stands on the, on the question of uh, traditional notions like Aristotelian categories, phrase boundaries, embedding, scope relations, um, um, agreement and, 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 and these classic traditional things that, that can only be explained if you assume uh, the reality of, of phrasal constituents. And, you know, some constructional models are, are, are aware of this, deal with this, you know, um, but uh, I think we could do a bit more on this um, also mm -hmm. in, in, in usage-based cognitive work. Yeah, mm. or the, the usage-based cognitive strain of things. Um, I also Absolutely. don't want to give up on it, but you cannot take over these things directly. You know, sometimes uh, phrase boundaries will blend. You know, sometimes they will disappear, especially on the lower levels. Um, sometimes we have to, we may have to give up on them. And, and personally, I, I, I'm no, no longer sure that we can assume those big categories like XP or VP or, or, or things like the, the category of noun. And the thing, yes, Langecker and the thing of a thing, you know, is doable, but perhaps people stay on the lower levels. But this all opens mm. up uh, a, a lot, lot of questions that we can, of course, not answer here. Yeah. Mm. The conclusion is that we're not finished yet. There's still no, that's good because it pays our work. bills, you know. I mean, I think <laughs> we should all be happy about this so we can come up with more magic tricks in the future, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think that's all the time we have and more, actually. Um, I've got nothing to add as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Lotta, do you, do you like... Uh, well, Bet, once again, thank you so word. much for, for, for this lovely talk um, mm. and, and very coming back to some of the really basic questions. And I think um, mm. Mm -hmm. very interesting. Well, thank you for livening up the discussion. And also thank you, uh, people at home, uh, for watching this and for uh, asking questions in the chat. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just going to say that yeah, I think you made a very compelling argument against Dalinian linguistics. I, I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, we needed a bad so, guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, we need a villain. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that was very that was fascinating that was uh, that was a very interesting discussion as well uh thanks for the organizers um yeah that's it i'm not sure what we're supposed to do now to end this i think uh, the organizers right. will take over perhaps okay and, uh, okay well have a good afternoon or a good evening or whatever uh, and yeah, see you at another Abralin talk or in real life, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.